Thank you for joining us. And we begin this morning with President Biden's first public comments since the United States shot down an alleged spy balloon and three unidentified aerial objects. Federal investigators are analyzing the wreckage of that first balloon, which the U.S. says was used by China for surveillance. Beijing denies those allegations, but the president said he won't apologize for shooting it down. And he plans to speak with his Chinese counterpart about this incident. Since then, three other objects were shot down by the U.S., but the president appeared to downplay a possible connection to China or any other foreign surveillance. We don't yet know exactly what these three objects were, but nothing, nothing right now suggests they were related to China's spy balloon program or that there were surveillance vehicles from other, any other country. The intelligence community's current assessment is that these three objects were most likely balloons tied to private companies, recreation or research institutions studying weather or conducting other scientific research. And checking in now with NBC's Monica Alba for the latest on this. So Monica, walk us through some of the president's uh, biggest points yesterday. And why has it taken him so long to address these incidents? It's all pretty much anybody can talk about. Yes, Stephen, these remarks came in response to mounting pressure, not just from lawmakers of both parties, but really many Americans who were just wondering what was happening and who wanted the White House to explain. So the president came out and he said the reason he took him a couple of days to give these remarks is because he wanted to have all the information he could share. And as you saw yesterday, there wasn't that much he could say, but at least now this hypothesis that these three objects that were shot down over Alaska, northern Canada and Lake Huron likely will end up being harmless, even though those recovery efforts are still in progress. And we're not quite sure when personnel will be able to reach them. But the president wanted to be clear that he has no regrets about this and that he says anything that's going to threaten the U.S. in the future could potentially be shot down. Here's a little more from what he had to say yesterday. We seek competition, not conflict with China. We're not looking for a new Cold War. But I make no apologize. I make no apologies. And we will compete and we'll be res- we'll responsibly manage that competition so that it doesn't veer into conflict. This has really tested the relationship once again between the U.S. and China, one that was already rocky for many other reasons. But the president wanted to be clear, though, that the first Chinese spy balloon that was shot down over the coast of South Carolina is very different than what the intelligence community is assessing occurred with these other three objects, and that there's nothing that indicates that they were doing the same kind of surveillance as that first massive balloon, which we understand is wrapping up in terms of its recovery. And a lot of that will be really telling for its stated purpose, Stephen. And Monica, I know our colleague Peter Alexander was able to speak exclusively with President Biden on the phone after that press conference. What more do we learn there? Yeah, the president was very clear in speaking to my colleague, calling him because Peter was at the press conference, wanted to ask a question there. And actually, because so many reporters were shouting in the end, President Biden didn't take any questions in that venue and instead called him. And Peter asked him whether he would be speaking with the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, anytime soon. And the president said, look, we should be in communication. He feels that that's important. But there was nothing on the calendar yet. So it's unclear when the two men will speak. Of course, they had that very long bilateral meeting in Bali last November, which was a key point in the relationship, but now it's unclear when the two will have a phone call in the future. And uh, you mentioned China in this, uh, obviously, after the balloon was first discovered, first shot down, China denying that it was a surveillance balloon. Has there been any reaction from China to the president's most recent comments? We did just hear from the Chinese foreign ministry just this morning, and they continue to push back and say that this wasn't a surveillance balloon, that it entered the U.S. by accident, that this wasn't anything that was intentional. And the U.S., of course, has pushed back on that repeatedly. The Chinese foreign ministry also said there are no plans for the U.S. and Chinese presidents to speak at this time. And they continue to make the claim that there were balloons over Chinese airspace, something that the U.S. has pushed back on vociferously, saying that is simply not true. But the president was clear yesterday. He hopes that President Xi Jinping doesn't want to rip apart this relationship, even though it's clearly as strained as it has ever been. Stephen. All right. A bit more clarity there. Monica Alba, thank you. 
Well, those comments from President Biden came yesterday after he got a clean bill of health from the White House physician. The president had a routine physical exam that took about three hours. Those results were released in a five-page summary afterward. For more on this, we're joined by NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar. Dr. Azar, thanks so much for being with us this morning. So keeping in mind that Biden did have COVID last year, overall, it's been good news for the president's health from his physician, Dr. Kevin O'Connor. So he put out this statement saying, quote, President Biden remains a healthy, vigorous 80-year-old male who is fit to successfully execute the duties of the presidency. So, Dr. Azar, taking a look at that summary, what are some of your takeaways from this? Yeah, Stephen, and of course, I always have to make the disclaimer that I am not the president's physician, so I don't have, you know, that kind of, of close microscope on his health care. But certainly, I think the communication from his doctor appears to be accurate. The only major change in the last year, as you mentioned, was that he had COVID last summer, but he, uh, you know, he recovered well with no, with no evidence of long COVID. You know, when we look at an assessment of any individual, really at any age, but certainly someone who's 80 years old like the president, there's really two domains. There's the physical as well as the mental or the cognitive. He had a very, very thorough physical exam. He does have some chronic conditions, as, as many individuals uh, do with age. He has atrial fibrillation. He's on a blood thinner for that. They also spend a little bit of time describing, again, uh, the very detailed neurological exam he had because of this stiffness that I think we've all uh, you know, witnessed or, or can observe when, when watching him walk, for example, um, with no evidence of, of any chronic neurological conditions like Parkinson's, which is very reassuring. He didn't undergo a formal cognitive assessment. Um, you know, that, of course, is the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the decision that his doctor can make, um, that he does or does not need one every single year. Um, he did have a lesion removed um, that looked uh, somewhat suspicious and was sent for biopsy, and, and those results are pending. But overall, Stephen, really quite a good assessment of his health. I wanted to ask you a bit more about that lesion that the president had removed uh, from his <clears throat> chest, sent off for biopsy. Is that anything to be concerned about? You know, Stephen, um, skin checks, right? We, we recommend them uh, pretty much yearly for most uh, individuals. Uh, and no, not at the moment. Um, I think that I, I, I would imagine that if it was a very concerning lesion like a melanoma, um, he may have indicated that in the report. Uh, the president does have a history of having non-melanoma skin cancers removed, such as basal and squamous cells. Um, you know, his wife just recently underwent a Mohs procedure for, for a similar type of non-melanoma cancer. Um, you know, so this is very routine, Stephen. They will send it for biopsy. If it does come back um, as a cancer, such as a basal or squamous cell, he will very un likely undergo a Mohs procedure himself, which has an incredibly high cure rate. And a good reminder that those skin checks are so important. And so, Dr. Azar, overall, Absolutely. you mentioned you're not the White House physician, but overall, is there <clears> anything <throat> here that could affect a potential re-election bid for the president next year? No, I don't think so. And, you know, as I'm reading the, his physical exam and the report, I think about all of my patients who are the president's age. And the thing is, unfortunately, as we get older, um, you know, time becomes that commodity that just doesn't, um, you know, go endlessly. And there are conditions that are associated with advancing age, falls, um, you know, the development of new, uh, you know, illnesses or conditions. At the moment, um, there, I don't see anything that would be disqualified qualifying for him from a physical, uh, you know, standpoint. But again, because of advancing age, there are always things that can theoretically happen. I wish him the best. Um, and, you know, some of these things, of course, you can't predict. All right. Dr. Azar, thanks so much for your insights this morning. And staying on health in Washington, newly elected Pennsylvania Senator John Fetterman has voluntarily checked into Walter Reed Medical Center to be treated for clinical depression. Now, this comes just one week after the freshman senator was hospitalized for feeling lightheaded. Fetterman also, of course, suffered a stroke last year while on the campaign trail. According to a statement from Fetterman's chief of staff, the senator, quote, experienced depression off and on throughout his life. It only became severe in recent weeks. After examining John, the doctors at Walter Reed told us that John is getting the care he needs and will soon be back to himself. NBC News White House correspondent Ali Rafa joins us now with more on this. Ali, thanks for being here. So what more do we know about his diagnosis? Of course, he did have that stroke last year and the recovery. Did any of that possibly play a role here? 
Yeah, Stephen, good morning. This news coming as a huge surprise to a lot of people yesterday. Uh, you talked about those recent health developments at the top there, and we're learning from a senior aide to Senator Fetterman how those physical health developments have impacted his mental health recently. This senior aide telling NBC News uh, that there was sort of this feeling that Senator Fetterman would have time to rest and, and restore after that high-stakes, high-profile Pennsylvania Senate race uh, in November, uh, but they say depression didn't follow that sort of timeline, this aide telling NBC that he's had to sort of adjust and learn more about himself, this new reality post-stroke. Uh, Fetterman, once a very lively and energetic man, now dealing with uh, the impacts of that stroke that's robbed him of some cognitive and communications abilities. We know that uh, he now walks around Capitol Hill with an iPad uh, that really dictates what people around him are saying because he has auditory issues now. Uh, so Fetterman dealing with depression, an issue so many people deal with uh, across the, the country, but he's dealing with it on a much more public, uh, more noticeable scale, Stephen. Yeah, no doubt. So difficult to deal with the recovery from a stroke and do so in the public eye. As we know, Fetterman's health was made a huge issue on the campaign trail. Do we know at all how this could affect his role in Washington, both near term and, and longer term? Yeah, the senior aide is saying that this isn't going to be a quick fix. This is going to take a couple weeks because Senator Fetterman is in inpatient care right now. Uh, doctors are uh, sort of trying different medications on him. That's going to take time, first of all, to take effect. And then uh, adjustments to that medication may be necessary. Uh, they say this will require more observation. Uh, and this is what's needed at this point to get him on this long-term investment, this uh, short-term uh, sort of care for this long-term uh, investment in his long-term care. Because when you think about it, he's only a month into a six-year term. So they're saying that this is what's needed right now, but they do uh, want to stress that uh, a resignation from his, from his role, from his position was never on the table, Stephen. And this is something so many people have to deal with. Uh, what about his uh, Senate colleagues? Are we hearing any responses from them? That's interesting because a lot of times we learn about sort of health problems from lawmakers after the fact, or they try to cover that up. Uh, and in this case, it was just a, it was a clear disclosure by Fetterman's team to announce this, and that's being met with really an outpouring of support from his colleagues in Congress on both sides of the aisle. Uh, for example, we saw tweets from uh, Democratic Senator Dick Durbin yesterday saying that uh, he's glad Fetterman is seeking care at this time. He says it's important to take care of your mental health, and it takes extreme strength to reach out when you need help. Uh, Republican Senator Ted Cruz saying mental health is real and serious, and I hope he gets the care he needs. Uh, so all of them, um, you know, expressing their love and, uh, and, and well wishes this morning, and they're saying that they commend him uh, for coming out publicly and addressing this, Stephen. Absolutely. Glad to see he's getting so much support. Ali Rafa, thank you. And speaking of mental health, it's always a good time to remind you, if you or anyone you know is struggling, you can text or call the Suicide and Crisis Hotline, crisis hotline at 988. All right, now to the latest on the derailed train in eastern Ohio and the growing concerns among residents about the safety of both the air and water there. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen has that story. <laughs> At the County Humane Center, Teresa McGuire says she hears about sick pets and livestock every day. We're hearing a lot of this. We're hearing a lot of decreased appetite, not wanting to drink. If they do drink, they're throwing up. Luke Lavin says he's too afraid to return to his home half a mile from the crash site. I don't want to go home because I don't, I don't have the answers to go home. Anger mounting in East Palestine. Nearly two weeks after a fiery train derailment and controlled burn of hazardous chemicals sent a huge, dark, toxic cloud over this rural community. And despite almost daily assurances that days later it was safe for thousands of evacuees to return home. What do you say to people who are just scared? You know, I, I say, uh, first and foremost, I'm a father, uh, a husband. All families want to be safe, and they need to know that their air is clean and their water is safe to drink. The country's top environmental official here personally trying to reassure residents. Was it the correct call to tell people that they could go back and end the evacuation? Uh, you know, the, the, the state uh, made that declaration in concert with both governors in Pennsylvania and Ohio. The state made the right call based on the data that we have. 
officials promising to expand environmental testing to areas further from the crash site and urging residents to seek medical attention if they're feeling ill. Norfolk Southern, the train operator, telling the community we will not walk away, posting an open letter after saying it feared for its employees' safety if they attended a recent town hall meeting. The company is facing demands for more accountability. They need to be here in the community. They need to be answering questions. Another of Norfolk Southern's trains derailed in Michigan. No hazardous materials aboard, no injuries, the company said. Meanwhile, in Ohio, residents keep a stockpile of bottled water and worry. And you're saying it's okay, but don't drink the water. Use bottled water. That doesn't make sense. Some huge trust issues here. Officials say they're being as transparent as possible posting as much information online as they can, including test results. But some residents we spoke to say they want independent experts involved in this, not just government officials. Now back to you. A lot of questions there. Ron Allen, thank you. All right, turning now to the latest in the Georgia grand jury investigation of former President Trump's attempt to meddle in the state's 2020 election results. Parts of its report released Thursday say some witnesses may have committed perjury. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander gets us up to speed. Well, after months of operating privately, now the special grand jury's report is at least partially public, but there's still a lot that we don't know. In Georgia, a special grand jury investigating former President Trump and his allies regarding the 2020 election says one or more witnesses may have lied under oath and the jury recommends indictments. The report, only partially public, out of fairness to future defendants, a judge says, all of it stemming from this phone call to Georgia's Republican Secretary of State. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes. That launched a sweeping criminal investigation into whether he and his allies broke the law while trying to overturn his 2020 election loss in Georgia. Jurors heard from 75 witnesses, though Mr. Trump's lawyers say he was never called to testify. Leading the investigation, Fulton County's Democratic DA, Fonnie Willis, who last year told us this. I don't care what status you've reached in life. If you come into my community and you commit a crime, you deserve to be held responsible. If he committed a crime in my jurisdiction, then it includes him. The Trump campaign calling the president's phone call perfect, saying the sections of the report do not even mention President Trump's name, adding that the former president did absolutely nothing wrong. And the DA has said that her decision on potential charges is imminent. Back to you. All right, Blaine Alexander, thanks so much. And joining us now for more on this, NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, good morning. As we just heard from Blaine there, according to this report, some witnesses uh, may have lied to the grand jury. They said that in that uh, Section 8 of the report. Um, what could that mean for those people? Boy, we are poring over this like it's some ancient religious text and yeah. trying to read into what it says and doesn't say. What we think we can say is that it's a lot shorter than some of the other reports that we've seen issued in other investigations of Trump. Uh, but all we can really left or all we're left saying is that there may be people who committed perjury and Trump and others are not ruled out as having recommended criminal charges against them. So it's really a wait and see. I mean, it doesn't rule anything out, but it does appear to create a bit of a benchmark in that the report concludes that there was no widespread fraud mm. in the election. Uh, and that, if that is an established fact, would be difficult to use as some kind of defense if people are indicted for attempting to subvert it. And that was a unanimous vote, according to the report, that they, there was no fraud. And we did get comment from the former president on this already on his platform, Truth Social. The president thanking uh, the special grand jury, saying the report was, quote, a total exoneration. So what are your thoughts on that? He says that he went on to say that the report didn't mention his name, but that was the whole deal with releasing just these three parts, that no names were in it, right? I love the PR of all this. Just declare total exoneration, even if that's exactly what the report does not say. The report does not make that conclusion. In fact, the worst case scenario is that it could potentially recommend charges against folks close to Trump and even possibly Trump himself. Again, those are only recommendations. This special grand jury is a bit of an anomaly in criminal law because it doesn't actually indict. It really just creates a report, gives it to the DA, and the DA can choose to indict. When you think about it, the DA could have dispensed with the grand jury report entirely. She could have just gone to a regular grand jury and sought an indictment. This is just an additional step that leaves us all wondering, what did they conclude? Because 
ultimately what they conclude is not binding on anyone, including the DA herself. And you mentioned this uh, a little bit already, that quote that we took away from this. No widespread fraud took place in the Georgia 2020 presidential election that could result in overturning the election. So we uh, we got that part in this uh, report that released these three sections that were released uh, as well. Walk us through how that relates to Trump and his team. If anyone, uh, Trump and his team, if any of them are indicted for their involvement in attempting to overturn the election, then a defense will likely be we reasonably believed or we actually believed that what we were doing was fighting against an injustice, that there was something uh, criminal afoot going on with this election, and we were railing against it, as is our right to do. But with a conclusion by the grand jury that there was no widespread fraud, that goes a long way towards diffusing that defense, that, hey, if there was no fraud, then it may not have been reasonable to fight against the results of the election. It's not conclusive. It's not a, uh, a piece of evidence that, uh, that decides the issue without further debate, but it goes a long way in dispelling the idea that this was a defensible uh, course of conduct to attack the results of this election. So now the ball's in Fonnie Willis's court, the DA, on if indictments actually come down. Is that right? It was always in her court. And really, that's why the special grand jury, in so many ways, was symbolic. They ha did not have the power to indict. They only had the power to investigate something the DA can do herself. And she can accept or reject the conclusions and seek an indictment, irrespective of this report, a report that mm -hmm. we haven't really seen much of anyway. All right. Dennis Valos, thanks so much. All right, it's time now for a check of our morning news now forecast. Angie Lastman joins us now. Hey, Angie. Hey there, Stephen. It's uh, we're gearing up, of course, for the weekend. It's Friday. Things are going to be nice a lot for a lot of folks across the country. But here's what we have to watch for: this line of showers and thunderstorms, and even some snow uh, that is associated with that same cold front that brought some severe weather to folks yesterday and the day before that. The good news is the severe weather threat has diminished a lot. The bad news is that it'll be a little bit of a soggy morning from basically Raleigh up through Boston. Uh, we'll see some of those snow. Uh, rain showers. Meanwhile, the interior areas of New England are going to see some snow showers. It all ends pretty quickly. By the time we get into the early afternoon, most of that will be offshore as the system continues pushing out towards the east. But of course, we could see some lingering impacts when it comes to travel. Here's those winter alerts that we see right now. Buffalo, Watertown, Burlington, all included in that. Northern parts of Maine, that's where you'll see the highest amount of snow totals. And that does come, in, uh, uh, that does come through the day today. Hence the reason that we have the winter winter storm warning in effect in bright pink there. The snow totals for that location, anywhere from two, four, six, even up to eight inches the farther north you go in Maine. A couple of, maybe an inch or two in other spots across the interior of New England. But either way, no snow for folks on the along the East Coast, especially New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. It's going to fall, that precipitation in the form of rain. It's quite warm. I'm sure you've noticed it. If you live in any of those cities over the past couple of days, we have been feeling very spring-like. So, about a quarter of an inch of rain for folks there. Here's where we started this morning, into the low 60s, mid 60s for some folks ahead of this front. By the time we get to early afternoon and especially into the evening hours tonight, these temperatures take a tumble as this front continues to work its way to the east. There's a lot of cold air behind it. Temperatures are in the 30s in the Midwest, so we'll see some cooler conditions on the way for Saturday, but it warms right back up by the time we get onto uh, Sunday. In places like New York, Stephen, 55 degrees. Wow, not bad at all. I do admit I turned the AC on last night in the, New York City. Here. I wished I, I had, trust I, me. I had to do it already. All right, thanks, Angie. We're back now with a look at more amazing rescues in Turkey over a week after a major earthquake brought devastation to the region. This man was safely brought to the hospital after spending 261 hours beneath the rubble. Here he is speaking to his relatives for the first time since that quake struck. While on a call, he asked for an update on his parents. Fortunately, they also survived. Plus, a teenage girl was pulled from the rubble alive after being trapped for more than 10 days. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley has more on the moment that lifted the spirits of a country that's dealing with so much heartbreak. 248 hours after a catastrophic earthquake shook southern Turkey, the miracles don't stop. This is 17-year-old Elena Olmez, rescued from the rubble of a building in the Turkish city of Kahraman Maraş. She's carried to a waiting ambulance. The crowd celebrates with applause. 
At the local university hospital, Elena smiles as she tells reporters how she survived the 11 days. I'm fine, thank you, she says. I had nothing with me. I just tried to pass the time. For family members, Elena's rescue is an answered prayer. <laughs> but for many other families in Kahraman Marash, the desperate search continues. One of the missing, 11-year-old Hadayat Ella Gokshu. Her grandparents waiting for news from rescue workers all day and into the night. My hands are tied, she says. I want to find my granddaughter, even if I freeze to death here waiting. Back at the university hospital, doctors get ready to send Elena to a bigger hospital in the capital city of Ankara. As she's moved, a reporter calls out, Elena, you'll be great. We love you. All of Turkey loves you very much today. Matt Bradley, NBC News, Turkey. World leaders are gathering in Munich, Germany this morning for the city's annual security conference. The war in Ukraine, of course, expected to top the agenda at the three-day event, with President Volodymyr Zelensky set to deliver the opening speech later today. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby is in Munich now with more on this. So, Courtney, this conference comes as we're coming up very quickly on the one-year anniversary of Russia's latest invasion in Ukraine. How will that play into this year's event, and do we know what we're expecting to hear from Zelensky? I mean, the, the war in Ukraine is basically the major focus of this event. It was this, the same way last year. It was on the eve of the actual invasion. Now we're on the one-year anniversary of that invasion, and Ukraine is still the major focus here. One of the, the things that I'm hearing a lot about already is the need to deter Russia, not just for in Ukraine, but for further expansion of any of, their, of Vladimir Putin's efforts to take other areas outside of Ukraine. But I'm also hearing a lot of talk about the need for Russia to be held accountable for what is happening to the Ukrainian people. And I think that that's something that we're going to hear more and more about over the next two days of conferences and events here. As you mentioned, we'll hear from the, the Ukrainian leadership. We'll also hear from a number of other world leaders, including uh, France's uh, Emmanuel Macron. We'll hear from, of course, of course, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Um, and then tomorrow we'll hear from uh, the U.S.'s Vice President Kamala Harris and Antony Blinken, Secretary of State. Most of these conversations, again, will be about Russia and Ukraine. We expect, according to a White House official, to hear from Vice President Harris about things like the Ukrainian people, their resilience, and how Russia needs to end this brutal war on the Ukrainian people right now. Uh, do we know anything else about what uh, Vice President Kamala Harris is expecting to talk about? She's leading the U.S. delegation there. Do we know anything else about her messaging? And it is an enormous delegation, not just from the, the White House and from the State Department, but there's a huge bipartisan congressional delegation here, as well as U.S. military leaders here for a number of meetings. I can tell you I've been trying to get in to see a lot of them, and they have meetings back-to-back <laughs> -back all day long today of all of the U.S. delegations. So, uh, but, but the major, the major uh, issue, or um, the, the major message that the U.S. is trying to send here is one of, uh, of support and commitment to the Ukrainian people. And, and, and I keep hearing the terms long-term commitment to the Ukrainian people. So when I ask what does that mean exactly, it's not just weapons and equipment, but a long-term com term commitment to the Ukrainian people rebuilding and, their, and supporting them no, long, no matter how long this war goes on in Ukraine. I've actually been surprised. I keep asking people here, U.S. officials, when you talk about a long-term commitment, does that mean that even if this conflict is going on one year, two years, five years from now, the U.S. will still be there supporting them in, in, with things like equipment, with intelligence, uh, and and I, I have gotten all around the board a resounding yes. Wow, an important question there. And uh, running out of time here, Courtney, but wanted to ask, we know China's foreign minister is supposed to be at the event as well. The Chinese uh, balloon incident still uh, still marinating there. Do we have any potential knowledge? Will he try to speak with <laughs> Secretary Blinken? Is that a meeting that's at all possible? So at this point, we haven't heard of anything official, but I got to tell you, I've been to this conference a number of times now, and we hear a lot about these sort of sidelines, or they call them pull-aside meetings. And that's, you, you mean, walking around in there, you can't walk five feet without seeing some world leader. So it's, it's very possible that they will see each other at some point. If they do, if they're able to speak, I imagine that the main topic is going to be these balloons, the surveillance program that the, that the Chinese have, and, and then also trying to reopen some of these lines of communication. The U.S. military uh, hotline to China has been, they haven't answered it for a, a number of months there, since, ever since um, Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan. They basically shut down that communication. So I suspect that will be something that they would talk about if, in fact, the two men meet here. All right, Courtney QB, on top of all of it, thank you so much.
All right, more international news now. Major protests in Beirut. NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman joins us now with more. Good morning, Josh. Hey, Stephen. Dozens of protesters attacked banks in the Lebanese capital, smashing windows, uh, breaking things, setting fire to tires, even blocking the roads. Uh, they're protesting limits on cash withdrawals that have been in place since Lebanon's economic meltdown started in 2019. These attacks came as the Lebanese pound has hit a record low, worsening the dire poverty there. Now to the Vatican, where Pope Francis is making clear he's not going anywhere. Although his predecessor, the late Pope Benedict, resigned, Pope Francis says that should be the exception, not the rule. He says unless his health gets in the way, he says no reason why he shouldn't serve for life. Francis making those comments during a trip to the Democratic Republic of Congo. And finally to Japan, where organizers are gearing up to host the Trash Picking World Cup in November. 20 teams from around the world, including the U.S., will compete for who can pick up the most trash from Tokyo streets in just one hour and to properly sort out the recyclables. Japan has been holding this competition for years at beaches, parks, and even riverbanks to try to promote sustainability. Stephen? All right, Josh Letterman, thanks so much for that update. Welcome back. A New Jersey school board is facing fallout from parents after the tragic death of a 14-year-old girl who died by suicide after being beaten by classmates on camera. A board meeting was held last night amid growing outrage from the community as they seek answers following new accusations that bullying is servicing at that same high school. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa has more. Calls for change grow louder in this New Jersey community. I really am fed up with the school because they had multiple numerous reports about Adriana being bullied and they didn't do anything to step in. With school officials in the hot seat during its first news conference since the tragic death of a 14-year-old student. Can you say, give any specifics around what could be done differently, though? Two questions. Not, not on that particular, I'm, I'm sorry, not on that particular case. It is a legal matter. I apologize. Moving into the future, we're going to continue to, to educate and to get better. Freshman Adriana Kush took her own life earlier this month, family says, just two days after she was beaten in the halls of Central Regional High School. Captured on this video obtained by WNBC, then circulated on social media. Her father says it was all mishandled by the district. I want to hold the school accountable. They're absolutely refusing to protect our children. Four students have been criminally charged in connection with the incident, according to prosecutors, and the superintendent has resigned. Adriana's tragic death comes amid startling new data from the CDC, revealing teen girls are experiencing record levels of violence, sadness, and suicide risk. In 2011, just over a third felt persistently sad or hopeless. That number skyrocketed to a stunning 57% a decade later. Experts say the factors that lead to suicide are often multifaceted, but a recent study found young people who experienced cyberbullying were more than four times as likely to report suicidal thoughts. Since Adriana's death, other alleged incidents of bullying at the school have resurfaced. Whoa. Attorney Jonathan Etman's client transferred out of Central Regional after he says she was attacked last year. The family now bringing a lawsuit against the school and district. I'm horrified, horrified that while we are in suit with the school, it's now happened again. And now this young girl, Adriana, has lost her life. The schools are just... They're not taking these these threats seriously enough. School officials did not respond to our request for comment on the lawsuit, but the acting superintendent addressing those concerns. Data alone, it doesn't indicate that we're a cultural of violence. We don't we don't condone that. Earlier this week, Governor Phil Murphy was asked if the state will be investigating bullying in the school or more broadly statewide. I, I can't say specifically, but the answer will be yes. We always look in the mirror after something like this, and this is an awful, awful, awful tragedy. A tragedy commemorated with a moment of silence as a heartbroken community seeks answers. Heartbreaking indeed. Emily, thanks for that. And again, want to reiterate, if you or anyone you know struggling, you can call and get help from the Suicide and Crisis Hotline. The number there on your screen, 988. Well, what prosecutors describe as a failed assisted suicide attempt was the focus in court yesterday during the double murder trial of former lawyer Alex Murdoch. Jurors were also presented with video evidence of Murdoch's interview with police shortly after that attempt. NBC News correspondent Katie Beck has those details. 
In court on Thursday, the highly contested, long-awaited evidence of Alec Murdoch's roadside assisted suicide plot. Video from inside an ambulance nearly three months after his wife and son's murder. Alec Murdoch tells first responders he was shot on the side of the road while changing a flat tire. It, sound, it sounded like a shotgun, even though it was so loud. The highly contested evidence of Murdoch's roadside suicide plot finally shown to the jury Thursday. In court, airing the misleading evidence Alec offered at the scene, telling investigators a shotgun might have been used and the first descriptions he gave of an unknown assailant. Okay. A real nice guy. Nine days later, investigators would learn a different story from Murdoch. The assailant was not only known, but related to him, his cousin Curtis Eddie Smith. Murdoch tells investigators in a recorded call with his lawyers that he asked Smith to kill him. I told him that things would get ready to get really bad and that I would be better off not here. And I asked him to shoot me. Even gave him the gun to do it so that his son Buster would collect on his $11 million insurance policy. Did Alec Murdoch ever say that there was any risk or threat to Buster? He said no. He, no, he did not. He actually denied it when we asked. Did Alec Murdoch say that Curtis Seti Smith had anything to do with the murders of Moselle? He denied it when we asked. And our thanks to Katie Beck for that reporting. Court adjourned yesterday with defense attorneys telling the judge that they plan to have a long cross-examination on this evidence coming up this morning as prosecutors hope to call their last witness later today. And turning now to a remarkable story of strength and courage. Tampa officials have released a new surveillance video showing the moment one woman successfully fought off an attacker while working out in her gym. Now she's speaking out about that experience and how she was able to make that getaway. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson has the latest. Surveillance video captured the incredible moment a Tampa woman fought off an attacker at her apartment complex's gym. I said, if I keep going, if I keep pushing, I keep fighting, he's going to stop. He's going to let go, and he finally did. 24-year-old Nishali Alma, a personal trainer, told Hillsborough County Sheriff's deputies she was exercising alone around 10 p.m. on January 22nd when she saw a man she'd previously seen at the gym trying to get in. Whenever he was at the door, I buzzed him in and he came inside. My thought process was, like you said, like it was just another dude coming in to work out. But after 25-year-old Xavier Thomas Jones entered, this happened instead. Next thing you know, I get up from doing my workout and I grab my phone and he just approaches me and not a single word was exchanged. As soon as he was approaching me, I pushed him. I said, bro, what the F are you doing? Uh, I said, get away from me. And he kept trying to come towards me and kept reapproaching me. Video shows Thomas Jones chasing her around the gym before grabbing Alma and pinning her down. In my mind, I knew I was stronger than him and I knew I could fight back. The seasoned weightlifter seen here holding her attacker in a chokehold while trying to call 911 before throwing more punches, leading Thomas Jones to release his grip. Self-defense expert Patrick Lockton at New York City's Krav Maga Institute says Alma's quick thinking under pressure was key. She fought back. And the most important thing, she didn't freeze. She didn't fall into that trap. Alma immediately ran outside, escaping to a nearby apartment. Now, she's sharing her story and encouraging other women with similar experiences to do the same. No other person should go through this. No other person should have to feel like this. No other person should have to go through a situation like this. Experts say avoiding an incident like this starts with being aware of your surroundings and moving quickly if you're in danger. Getting in the way, creating obstacles, creating an opportunity, a space between you and your attacker. So I'd be going straight for, for vulnerable. So again, just the, the eyes hitting him in the nose with a phone, strike him in the throat because everybody is soft tissue there, it's soft tissue in your eyes as well, and it's going to hurt everybody no matter how strong you are. Authorities were able to track down Thomas Jones and arrested him the next day. He pled not guilty to charges of sexual battery, false imprisonment, and kidnapping, and will appear in court next month. An attorney for Thomas Jones did not respond to NBC's request for comment. The day he was arrested and the day they caught him, I saw, I saw the whole thing go down. It was a relief. Priscilla Thompson, NBC News. Incredible quick thinking there. Priscilla, thank you. We're back now with a look at the nationwide shortage of a critical drug used to treat ADHD in both children 
and adults. In recent years, prescriptions for Adderall and similar drugs have jumped dramatically, but supplies just are not keeping up, leaving many people unable to find the medication the doctors say they need. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has more. For adults and children who need it, Adderall, other ADHD meds, and the generics can make all the difference in concentrating, multitasking, and lowering overall stress. But today, millions of Americans can't fill their prescriptions amid a nationwide shortage. It's very hard to concentrate and remember things. Near San Francisco, single mom Lisa Javaharian and her doctor have been struggling to find pharmacies with the Adderall that both Lisa and her 14-year-old son rely on. So I'm kind of thinking of rationing now, but I don't know how that's going to affect myself as well as my son. He is more important, so I'd rather not ration him. Adderall and similar meds have officially been in short supply for nearly six months. I've been practicing medicine for 25 years. There's never been a shortage like this. 97% of community pharmacists report a shortage. Teva Pharmaceuticals, the prime supplier of Adderall, says manufacturing problems are mostly resolved. But demand has jumped dramatically. U.S. prescriptions more than doubled in the past 12 years with a big surge during the pandemic when doctors were seeing patients remotely. Because Adderall can be abused, the DEA sets strict production quotas. It's almost similar to... Um, trying to stop drunk driving by not allowing the sale of cars. People who need these medications no longer have access to them because of these quotas. The DEA says most manufacturers have plenty of supply and have not fully hit their supply quota for three years. But clearly demand right now does seem to be outstripping supply. Back to you. All right, Tom, Cos Tom Costello, thank you. All right, now to financial headlines. Despite avoiding mass layoffs, unlike its competitors, Apple is now looking at making some big job cuts of its own. CNBC's Christina Partzanevelos joins us now with that and more. Good morning, Christina. Good morning. So let's start with Apple. Apple has actually been laying off hundreds of contractors over the past several days, some of whom work directly with Apple employees on projects. So this is coming from the New York Post. They're saying that Apple's terminated them outright instead of waiting for their contracts to expire. And so this this is news because Apple previously had largely avoided the mass layoffs that we saw at uh, Dropbox, at Meta, the list continues. And a lot of these big tech rivals have resorted to layoffs because of uncertainty in the U.S. and global economy. The delivery boom sparked by the pandemic keeps boosting the fortunes of companies like DoorDash. The servicing revenue rise in the fourth quarter of last year as consumers spent more on deliveries of food and household essentials, even if prices rose and more restaurants reopened. DoorDash has now more than 32 million monthly users and its Dash Pass premium service now has more than 15 million members. TikTok is taking a page out of HQ Trivia's playbook, launching a series of live trivia games. Users can log in to play between February 22nd and the 26th, and TikTok is going to offer $500,000 in cash prizes that will be spit between, between winners. You must be 18 years or older, and you have to be in the U.S. to participate, but the categories include lifestyle, beauty, sports, music, along with questions about John Wick. The event, there's the catch, is sponsored by Lionsgate and the upcoming film, John Wick Chapter 4. So I guess people will have to go back and watch the other chapters. There I've... are several chapters, but people are so excited about that. All right. Oh, I, I should go watch it then. Yes, you, yeah, you should. There are a few of them. <laughs> Christina, thanks so much. Thanks. Welcome back. Actor Bruce Willis is known for taking down bad guys in Hollywood action movies, but now his family revealing that the acting legend is facing a different type of fight, a diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia. Kaylee Hartung joins us now from Los Angeles with more on this. Kaylee, so many people giving the Willises their uh, well wishes right now. Yeah, absolutely, Stephen. And his blended family has really been in lockstep since they first revealed that he was facing health challenges last spring. Now they are sharing this difficult news that his condition has progressed and say they have a deeper understanding of what he's experiencing. I promise, Grace. This morning, the family of legendary Hollywood action star Bruce Willis sharing new details about the cruel disease they say he's battling. Plenty more where that came from. Nearly one year after Willis was diagnosed with aphasia, a disease that impacts his cognitive abilities, forcing him to retire from his blockbuster acting career, his family saying in a statement, Bruce's condition has progressed and we now have a more specific diagnosis. 
frontotemporal dementia. The critically acclaimed actor became a bona fide star as the action hero John McClane in the Die Hard franchise. Yeah, I'm still here. Unless you want to open a front door for me. And in 2015, Willis shared on Today, he was checking off another bucket list item, Broadway. I had never been on Broadway, and uh, it, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it is the big time. Starring in Misery, an adaptation of Stephen King's book. Now the Golden Globe winner is facing a different challenge offstage. This rare form of dementia, known as FTD, affects areas of the brain associated with personality, behavior, and language. It tends to occur at a younger age than other forms of dementia, the onset often between 45 and 60 years old. Willis, now 67, is among the 50 to 60,000 Americans fighting it. His family saying, unfortunately, challenges with communication are just one symptom of the disease Bruce faces. While this is painful, it is a relief to finally have a clear diagnosis. Welcome to the party, pal. Willis's blended family has rallied around him through this difficult time. His wife, Emma, their two daughters, as well as his ex-wife, Demi Moore, and their three daughters, writing in their latest statement, Bruce has always found joy in life and has helped everyone he knows to do the same. It has meant the world to see that sense of care echoed back to him and to all of us. There's currently no cure for FTD, and there are no treatments to slow down or stop the progression of the disease. But Willis's family says that's a reality they hope they can change as they try to shine a light on it. Stephen. Glad he's getting so much support. Kaylee, thank you. All right, now to the two-year-long journey of a missing cat from Florida who was found earlier this week, 1,400 miles away in Kansas. The adorable orange tabby cat named what else but Lucky was turned into the Prairie Village Police Department by a local resident. And thankfully, Lucky was microchipped. Animal control officers discovered the tabby had traveled all the way from Miami over those years. Quite the journey. The department has contacted the owner and hopes to reunite them soon after Lucky's very long vacation, a reunion we hope to not miss. And that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now, but your news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.